Okay, I, I, I'm hoping that uh, you guys were patient and uh, that you could go out and come back in. I'm back online. All right. I'm just going to wait for a few of you to get back on. Sorry about that. Yeah, we're sorry about that. Uh, as soon as some of you get back on, I'll continue with the program. Uh, let's see. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. God bless you all. So as soon as you're able to get back on, uh, please let me know by writing and saying good morning again. <laughs> Uh, my apologies, uh, it froze, it came back on, and then it froze again, and so uh, the best way to deal with that is to get off and start all over again, and it takes a while to get back on live, so uh, now I'm seeing some people, no, I'm not seeing them, no, that's, that's the wrong one, hallelujah, okay. No, that's not it either. Okay, folks, I'm having, I'm having, uh, I'm having some issues with the signal. Uh, Okay, I see that Gloria's on. I'm having some issues with the signal. I don't know why. There doesn't seem to be any reason for it other than that the the uh, signal from uh, the provider is weak and uh, for some reason it's causing a hiccup. I'm going to continue. Uh, I'm going to continue. Uh, Recording. I'm going to continue recording and then we'll post it back up in a little while. All right, folks, I'm so sorry about that. I was hoping we could be live, but uh, let me let me post it. Let me post it on the page. OK, so let's. Facebook Live. We will record the Advent devotions and post them after the recording. Okay. Unfortunately, that's the name of the game. All right, so it doesn't seem to be working properly, and so I'm just going to go forward. This happens uh, once or twice a year, I suppose, and some weeks worse than others. I imagine there's a major traffic going on in terms of uh, broadband, and um, it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. And so I'm going to record it and then post it, and that way I, I, I don't 
waste any of your time nor my time. Uh, again, our apologies. Uh, it, it, it seems to be um, a weak signal coming into my home. And uh, as a result, um, uh, as a result, uh, I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to belabor it. If it stops, I'm going to record and then post it. So that, that's my final decision. If you're seeing me live for some reason, if there's some miracle out there where I'm on live, then realize that I don't know if I'm on live because I don't see any comments coming. So I don't know if I'm on live. And, and as far as I can tell, uh, we're not on live. I'm recording. And uh, I'll, I'll see if I can you know, edit this part so that when I do post it, you don't have to be hearing this over and over and over again. All right. So uh, the announcements were, and, and we'll make this these announcements uh, this Sunday. This Sunday, be prepared to hear about a change in schedule on the last uh, two services of the year um, and, and uh, the last service of the year and the first service of the year. Yeah. Uh, there, there, there's been a change in schedule. All right, so let, let's not waste any time and let's go straight to our, um, let's go straight to our, uh, there we go. And uh, this, this should, this should, our Advent 2022. And Advent, we explained yesterday, the Advent means the arrival or the coming. And it is the, the last, um, uh, four Sundays before by that end up in Christmas and it's a season in the church calendar where we begin to reflect and prepare our hearts for the celebration of the, the first coming of Messiah and, and enthusiastically motivating us to look forward to the second coming which is when he will finish the rescue operation and that is something that we long for. This battle against sin and evil is wearing and tearing at us. And God is speaking to us not to give up. And he's telling us that we should move forward and we should rebuild the walls and that we should level up and rise up to the occasion and say, I need a greater anointing to do a greater work in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so um, we, we just ask you guys to, to just... Uh, do the best that you can. You come back on and, and catch this recording because it's an important message. It's a reminder to us that God is never taken by surprise. And so we're, we're going off what, where we left off yesterday, Genesis 3, 14 and 15, where God is bringing judgment upon mankind for having transgressed and violated God's law. And in, in, in violating God's law, there's a consequence. And this is what people have great difficulty with. When you violate a rule that God has established, um, you will experience consequences, and those consequences are inevitable. You cannot avoid them. And the, uh, the, the consequence of sin is death. Death begins. Death is a long separation from God, uh, both spiritually, psychologically, and biologically, your body begins to age. The systems begin to break down. And we are subject to death, murder, homicide, assassinations, poison, uh, illness, diseases, satanic, diabolical wars, uh, rumors of wars, catastrophes, um, 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 hurricanes, twisters, earthquakes, uh, the violence uh, of evil and, uh, 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 and hatred. And all of these things are a consequence of our transgression. We broke the law of God. And when we say we, 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 we're talking about generically all of humanity is in this boat. All of it was in this boat. Some of us were able to get off that boat that is ending up in total and eternal separation from God. This is the hope that we have, that you, by hearing the good news of Jesus Christ, will get off that boat that is destined for eternal damnation, eternal separation from all that is good, eternal separation from all that is righteous, eternal separation from God. God is the source of our life. And when we are eternally separated from him, we are eternally lost. And that is something that that is a shame because God 
provided a way out, a, a, an escape from that condition, an escape from that destination. And that escape is called the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that Jesus was born and that he lived and that he conquered evil and that he was crucified and he was buried. And on the third day he rose and he spent 40 days uh, confirming his disciples and giving them instructions. And on that 40th day, he ascended to the throne from whence he came and he returned to his first estate where he is the the second person of the Holy Trinity and his job is to intercede for us. He, he intercedes for his saints. Why? Because in this mopping up operation from his first coming to his second coming, the church is called to preach the good news, to establish and declare that the king, the king is coming and that the kingdom of God is present and that we need to repent and believe and put our faith and our trust in him. And when we put our faith and our trust in him, he covers us. He covers us of all our sins. There's therefore no more condemnation. We are free from the from the, the consequence of sin because he paid it. He paid it for us. We can't earn it. There's nothing that I could do religiously in, in any way, shape, or form. I cannot earn his God's pardon. I cannot earn his righteousness. It is given to me. I receive it by faith. And so we are saved by grace through faith, through faith, through our trusting in his work on Calvary, we apply, the Holy Spirit applies to our hearts the benefits of that sacrifice and that resurrection. No longer am I separated from God. God is attached to me and I am attached to God. He lives in me and I live in him. And now the life that I live, I live by faith in my Lord and Savior who loved me and gave himself for me. And he's coming back. The same way he came the first time, he will come again. But this time he will not be born of a woman. He shall come as the mighty warrior, rescuer, and the king of kings and lord of lords to govern in this world until all the enemies of God are put to death. And then he shall return everyone to God, and God will recreate the heavens and the earth. We are a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new, and we shall be forever with God where there is no more trouble, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more sickness, no more death, no more devil, no more demons, no evil. We shall be forever with him and one with him, and God will be all in all forever sovereign king. All right. So that's the message. That's the good news. That's the Christmas story, really. And uh, so I wanted to go back to the first promise. The very first, uh, the, the, the first promise is found in Genesis 3.15. And it says, when God is speaking to the serpent, he's speaking to the serpent, the serpent, which is a metaphoric, allegorical representation of Satan, Satanas, Satan, the adversary, the opposer, the diabolos, the devil. The, the, the devil is the deceiver. He is the author of death. He is the author of disease. He is the author of all evil. And he will be destroyed finally. He's in the process of, of, of reaping everything he has sowed. He knows his time is short. But in the meantime, he wants to take as many out as he can with him. He's an evil being. There is nothing good in him, nothing good whatsoever. He is irredeemable. There is no salvation for him or his cohorts. And those who want to live after him and, and, and imitate him and be uh, seduced by him, they will also meet his fate. They shall be cast into the lake of fire for all eternity, separated from all that is good, all that is lovely, all that is perfect. That is the benefit of those who trust in the Lord, who give their life to Jesus Christ. Amen. And so in this promise, God is speaking to the serpent who represents Satan. He says, I'm going to put enmity. That means I, I'm going to make you uh, the enemy of humanity and humanity is going to be your enemy. Wow. So we are designated to be in conflict with Satan. We are designated. This is unavoidable. The Christian life is a war, a war against the evil one. He says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. The woman is Eve 
the woman is the one who was deceived, lied to, seduced, totally, totally deceived by Satan. The man sinned willingly, not wanting to lose his wife. He chose to follow her and transgress and violate God's law. And as a result, both beings the, the, that are really one flesh, fully fallen before God, and, and they reap the consequences of that. They begin to realize that they're naked. They begin to become ashamed. So shame, nakedness, unprotected, uncovered, everything that uh, it, it makes you vulnerable is, 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 is what you are going to experience because you're uncovered. The the humanity was meant to exist under the covering of God. When we violate God's law, we lose his covering. He wants to cover us again, but he wants to cover us with the redemption of Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. And it is by way of his sacrifice on Calvary that we are covered. The blood of Jesus covers us. God no longer sees our sins. He sees us as if we were like Jesus. And Jesus gives us his righteousness. We cannot earn it. We can't win it. There is not enough holiness in us to win it. He gives it freely, freely to those who believe. All you have to do is believe, but believe is not just a mental ascent. It is a complete trust where you give yourself over and totally allow him to be in control of your life. And he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed. This is a key word in the book of Genesis. It really becomes a key word in all of Revelation. The seed of the woman is that that the child that she will give birth to, the seed of the woman uh, and her seed uh, and, and so there's going to be an enmity, there's going to be a fight between the seed of Satan, Satan and, and, and his spirit, the devil, is going to be a, a fighting against the seed of the woman. In this case, it's Jesus Christ, and Jesus wins. He wins by losing. <laughs> he gave his life up for us, but he wins because on the third day he rose from the dead. Hallelujah. He rose from the dead. And when he conquered sin, Satan, and, and, and the world, and the devil, we are free from the penalty of sin. We are free from the power of sin. We are free from the destination of sin. He, he delivers us unto his kingdom. And he says, and he says, the seed of the woman, you know, the seed of the woman is going to be the object of the devil's a hatred, and he shall bruise your head. The seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent, and the head of the serpent is going to bruise its heel. So the child of the man child, because it's a male personal pronoun, in this case, there isn't any of this ambivalence as to what gender it is. It is a male personal pronoun. He shall bring he shall bruise your head, Satan. He shall bruise your head with his heel, and you shall bruise his heel. You'll abide it. You, you're not going to go down without causing some, some pain, and he'll take the pain. He'll take the poison for us. Hallelujah. And he'll beat and supersede that poison with the holy blood of the second person of the Holy Trinity. And so here we find that in the very beginning of this tale, that this 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 story, this narrative, uh, whether it's metaphorical, it's allegorical, whatever, it, you choose to understand it. We understand that God uses allegory and metaphor to explain things that are beyond our capacity to, to, to really grasp. And so he gives us illustrative uh, uh, details. And these in these illustrative details, we don't pursue them as exactly, you know, uh, detail by detail exactly in that form. It, 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 it is a prophetic and it is an allegorical explanation. And in that allegorical explanation, the seed of Satan, which is the that which Satan produces, which is murder, hatred, religious um, persecution, all of those things that led to Jesus's crucifixion under the Roman Empire. It was the Romans that put him to, to the cross and the religious leaders of the temple Temple. They are the ones who who executed this great 
great uh, betrayal uh, of the Son of God, and they crucified him, but death could not hold him. The tomb could not hold him. The stone and the seal of Rome could not hold him. He conquered death. He conquered sin. He conquered sin's effect, the separation from God. He reunites, and he experiences the victory, and he conquers death, sin, and everything that opposes the knowledge of God. That's the message of Christmas. Now, we go further and understand that Christmas is foretold. Jesus is the fulfillment of prophetic prophecies, prophetic messianic, prophetic statements in the Old Testament. And they begin in the very beginning, the book of Genesis. And we see it. We see it there, that Christmas is foretold. What do we learn about Christmas? That, first of all, Christmas is the birth of a child who is going to grow up to become a man. And he's not a usual man. He is an unusual man. He is a supernatural man. He is a super divine man. For his father is not a human father, but his father is God, a very God, and and his, the, his conception is by work of the Holy Spirit in a young maiden's womb. It was deposited this this human being who is fully human, but his nature is protected from that humanity by his divinity, and in his divinity, because he comes from God, he is the Son of God. He forms and he grows up to be a man. And at the age of 30, he begins his itinerant mission of preaching and proclaiming the good news, the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. And in that, it comes to a head between the seed of of the serpent and the seed of the woman. So we learn that Christmas is a story about a woman who gives birth to a male child who will grow up to be our savior. And in that battle, he will be wounded on his heel, but his heel shall crush the head of the serpent. Now, when you when you wound the heel uh, of someone, you cause pain, but he still is able to exert power. But when you crush the head, when you bruise the head of a serpent, no longer has the capacity to fight. The the head is crushed, it's bruised, and everything is in the head. The head, this is where the heart lies. This is where the rationale lies. This is where intelligence works, and it is crushed. When you crush the head of a serpent, nothing in the serpent is able to function again. So whereas the child of the woman is bruised, Bruised, the serpent is crushed. And that's Christmas. Hallelujah. It's a spiritual battle. And we also see that Genesis being perhaps the most important book of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, for in it we see the seeds that will blossom in the remainder of Holy Scriptures as the rescue operation of God to redeem His creation. In other words, that's just the beginning. That is just the beginning, and for the last 2,000 years, we the church has been preaching the gospel. And I, mean, and I mean church by, but what I mean by church is not the structures, the buildings that you see all over the place. The, the, those are temples, those are sanctuaries, those, those are buildings. No, the church of Jesus Christ is the body of Christ. The body of Christ is a spiritual body, a spiritual body. Men and women who are connected, men, women, youth, and children who are connected by one principle— They love God more than anyone else. And that is the first commandment and the greatest commandment. And they love their neighbor as themselves. They're willing to die. They're willing to die for the gospel. They're willing to sacrifice themselves for the gospel. They preach day and night. They dedicate themselves to proclaiming the kingdom of God. And they shall win in the end because God already won at the beginning. Before the worlds began. Before the worlds began, God put into motion his victorious, victorious rescue operation. And so what is it? Rescue operation, he sends a man who will fulfill the law that humanity violated. All of us have violated. If we violate one, one of the 613 commandments, we are guilty of violating them all. We are guilty of violating them all. So it is not the, the particular sin that you do, it's the condition you end up in. 
once you violate. Once you violate, you remain in a condition of lostness, separation from God. You can't reach him. He has to reach out and rescue you. And so he reached out and rescued us on Christmas morning. And he came in the form of a babe, very vulnerable, very subject to all kinds of diabolical attacks. There was a plot to assassinate him. Many, many, many male boys in Bethlehem lost their lives because a diabolical cohort of Satan, a man named Herod the king, Herod the great, one of the greatest kings of Israel, one of the most renowned kings of Israel, becomes a son of a devil, and he tries to kill Messiah. Not able to, Joseph is wise, and he goes to Egypt, the very place where Israel had been captive for over 400 years, is the very place that God uses to protect them. God turns what was meant for evil into good. And that's a theme that runs from Genesis to Revelation. God turns what is intended for evil for good. The woman was deceived. Guess what? The woman is the vehicle by way by way the Savior will come. She is the conveyor of the redemption story. She who was deceived carries the Savior. Hallelujah. Amen. Ooh, the presence of God is all over me. I have to tell you, this is a great, great story. Now, in Genesis 3.15, we find God communicating the consequences of the fall of mankind as he addresses Satan in the form of a serpent. And he declares that the animosity, animosity, this hatred between the seed of the woman and the seed of Satan will result in a redeeming wound. In other words, there's going to be wounding, but there's a wounding that is unto death and there's a wounding that is unto redemption. The wounding of Satan is unto death. Satan will be eternally separated from God. Death means to be separated from the source of life. And so he will be eternally separated from God. And, 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 and But there's a wounding for redemption. What is the wounding of redemption? Bleeding, the blood that covers the sin. And so the, Jesus's wound is redemptive. Satan's wound is condemnatory. Hallelujah. There are two different types of wounds in this story. And so there's a wounding that kills you. And then there's a wounding that saves you. And Jesus did his greatest work of redemption while bleeding and dying on the cross. But that's not the end of the story. Hallelujah. Sunday morning he rose. Thank you, Jesus. And so his, his wounding was not fatal. Hallelujah. So what else do we see? Satan's deception of the woman, which led to the disobedience, disobedience of man. Adam oh, willingly violated. The woman was deceived, but the man willingly violated. And so that leaves mankind under the judgment and the apparent final, apparent in quotations, I would say, apparent final death blow of all humanity. All humanity is under the consequence of the fall of Adam and Eve. And it and all of humanity is being judged, and the result is a severe bruising of the head. Ooh, when Jesus crushes the head of Satan, that bruise cause mankind to find a way of escape. The seed of the woman is described with a male personal pronoun. Look at that. The male post personal pronoun. Now, none of this crazy confusion that we have today where we don't know what a woman is. We don't know what a man is. We don't know what anybody is. It just seems that the more we, we grow scientifically, the more foolish we become and, and the weaker mentally we become. We don't know what is a man and what is a woman. I'll tell you what is a man and what is a Woman, a man is what God says he is, and a woman is what God says he is. He's the one who created us. We didn't create ourselves. So we go to the source. And when we go to the source, we find out that this woman gave birth to a male child. And that male child will be the object of Satan's attack. Every day of his life, there will be an attack to destroy him, to seduce him, to cause him to fail at the plan of redemption. And the seed of the woman is described as a man-child, because redemption will come from her seed. The very woman who was deceived was the very is the very source of redemption. What is the source of redemption? A source of redemption was a young lady, a teenage girl, a teenage girl who was living in Nazareth, but of Judah's line. And she marries a man older than her, named Joseph, 
and it's be she's betrothed to him, which means they do a ceremony and they make vows of chastity uh, for each other. They are now they are now legally married. They don't cons consummate the 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 marriage until a year later. That gives the man more time to create money, which he will give as a dowry to the young lady's dad, and 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 that and that gives him a time to prepare a home and a place for her, separate from his his siblings, separate from his parents. And so Mary then goes on to live where Joseph had a carpenter shop, and it was in Nazareth, one of the poorer sections, all the way up north. And uh, there she gave birth. Uh, well, not there, but she travels because there's a census given by Caesar Augustus, who declared himself to be God, called himself Curios, or Adonai, the Lord of the Empire. And uh, he calls a census, and and in the census they had to bring tribute, taxes, economical taxes given. And so by the time they arrive to Bethlehem, she's due to give birth, and she gives birth, but there's no room. There's no room, and so she gives birth uh, uh, in a manger uh, where, where apparently the animals uh, had access to it, and, and, and it was probably cleaned and probably set up as, as, as a home. Uh, and we're not thinking that, you know, he's, she's giving birth next to, to, to lambs and, and cow dung. No, I'm pretty sure they cleaned it and they prepared it. But, uh, you know, there was a manger. This, this is a place where you put hay, and, and, and instead of putting hay, they cleaned it. They probably put blankets, and there she laid the baby. Okay, uh, in Spanish, it's called Latinaja. Yeah, and so that's redemption. And so her seed, being a man-child, will enter into conflict with the seed of Satan, and both will experience a wounding or a bruising. The seed of the serpent will bruise the man-child's heel, but the man-child will bruise the head of the seed of Satan. This metaphorical illustration reveals that both parties are wounded. Yet the wounding is of greater consequence to the seed of the serpent because the seed of the serpent will be wounded in the head. You crush a man's head. That's it. It's the end. When you have brain death, that's it. Your heart can still be beating and you're still dead because without the brain, the heart will eventually stop. Okay. Um, but the man child's bruised in his heel. Now, a bruised heel, you can continue walking, you can continue, you're in pain, but you continue fighting. He crushed the head of the serpent. The serpent bit and, and wounded and bruised his heel. So we see that the wounding of Jesus is not fatal. It is not a, a, a terminal condition, whereas Satan is terminally defeated. Can you say that with me? Satan is terminally defeated defeated. He's not partially defeated. He is a liar and he wins more by lying than by doing anything. He is terminally defeated in the name of Jesus by the blood of Calvary, by the resurrection power of a Sunday morning. Hallelujah. And so what we see, the significance of the location of this bruising conflict is not lost to us since the head is of greater importance is greater in uh, an import than the heel, okay? What is prefigured here is the importance of the expiatory and propitiatory wounding of the man-child. What do I mean by that? Expiatory and propitiatory. Expiatory means a payment has been offered. What is the payment that has to be offered for sin? Death. So Jesus offered his life and gave up his life and died for us. What is propitiatory? Propitiatory is that which covers the sin. And so by giving up his life, he paid. And by bleeding, he covered because life is in the blood. And so the expiatory, that's a theological term, and the propitiatory, that's also a theological term. In other words, his death had a double anointing. He paid it in full and he covered us completely. Hallelujah. He paid it in full and he covered us completely. And so in his wounding, he bleeds and he gives up his life because he couldn't die unless he gave up his life because he had never sinned. But his bleeding covers all our sin. And so the consequence of sin is death. However, the man child is not reported as dead yet. He first bleeds. 
Then he dies, and then he rises. Hallelujah. Before the poisonous wounding of the man-child's heel, there is a crushing blow to the serpent's head. This prefigures the finality of the battle. The finality of the battle. The finality of the battle. That should be underscored in that there is no more conflict. Why? No further description of the conflict is needed. God doesn't say, oh, and this fight will go on for all eternity. No, 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 no. There's an end to it. There's an end to it. Once the head is bruised, there's no more threat. This, there is no more threat to this representative humanity. To, to this child, there's no more threat because the, the head of the serpent is bruised. He's no longer able to see him. He's no longer alive to bite him. He doesn't, he doesn't have any movement possible because he's crushed to death. Hallelujah. How do we know this? Well, the fulfillment of the Messianic prophecy is found in the New Testament. Whatever is prophesied in the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New Testament. What is the prophecy? It's found in both Hebrews 2.14 and 1 John 3.8. Inasmuch then as the children, this is Hebrews 2.14, beautiful scripture. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood. Who are the children? The believers. Both Jew and Gentile, by the way. The children have partaken of the flesh. No, everyone who believes is partaking of the flesh and the blood. This is it's just prefigured in Holy Communion. It's prefigured in Holy. In other words, when we take the bread, we're saying that we identify with his death. His death is our death. When we drink from the cup, we are saying that his blood spilt is our blood spilt. We drink the cup of the covenant, and we are covered. That, that's our signature. We take it. We partake. That's why it's, it's foolish not to partake in Holy Communion. It is just absolutely foolish. And so he said, no, I'm not ready because I, I hate that sister. I, I can't get along. No, no. That's foolishness. You need to forgive that sister and take communion because it's, it, this is the, 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 the evidence. This, the, this is, rather, the, the, the benefit of believing in Jesus Christ. That through his death, that through death he might destroy, not that he might wound, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Who had the power of death? The devil. The devil had the power of death. He had the power to deceive mankind and bring him into a state of death. And so what happens when Jesus, through his blood and his sacrifice, he destroys, he destroys him who had the power of death. Destroy is not a mediocre word. He doesn't just wound him. He doesn't just bruise him. He destroys him who had the power of death, who had the power. He no longer has the power of death. He had the power of death. That is the devil. And so we see that Jesus' blood and his sacrifice paid for our salvation. So uh, 1 John 3 eight says, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. So sinning is a product and a result of following after the devil's ways. Now, we're all sinners and we all fail, but we are rescued by God's love. We are rescued by his grace. We are rescued by his compassion and his mercy. For this, and it says, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning, but for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Now, we're realizing that he came to be born. He was in Mary's womb for a purpose. Every life has a purpose. You have a purpose. We have a purpose. And what was his purpose? He was, his purpose was that he might destroy the works of of the devil. Not only will he destroy the devil, he will destroy the... What is the works of the devil? Death, hell, condemnation, guilt, all of these evils, racism, ugliness, hatred, uh, violence, war, cursings, uh, blasphemy, heresy, all of these things that separate us from God. He destroys them all. How does he destroy them? With the blood of the Lamb. He conquers. He covers every sin. There isn't a sin that can't be covered by his blood. Wherever he applies his blood, that sin is covered. We are covered by the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I know I'm, I'm just preaching to the, to the choir here, which is my microphone and my camera, because our, our, um, our lesson today was interrupted by poor signals. But I'm going to record it, finish it, and post it so that you can catch it. 
Amen. And so uh, we, we thank God that the first promise of Christmas is at the very fall of mankind. God does not waste time. He saved us to the utmost. To the utmost, Jesus saves. To the utmost, Jesus saves. To the utmost, Jesus saves. Amen. God bless you all. A reminder to pray for Mimi's uh, sister, Helen, for Peter Garcia's wife, Jeanette, for Pastor Sasha, for all those that are going through sickness, for Minister Mark Lee, uh, who I talked to yesterday, did a Zoom with him. He's doing much better. Thank you, Lord. And uh, he'll probably be with us on Sunday. So um, our sister, Sunny, Sunny Santiago, yes, forgot to add her name, but God doesn't forget her. Sister Sunny, Sister Sunny is, uh, we call her Sunny. Her name is Sol Maria. La hermana Sol Maria está bastante enferma. She's, she's affected with a respiratory infection. And uh, it's been very hard for her to, to breathe. Uh, she's not hospitalized, hospitalized, but she's she's not feeling well at all. And so we're, we're praying for her to do better. Titi Doris, we're praying for her to do better in the name of Jesus. So let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord. We're, we are grateful, O oh God, that you give us the ability to overcome even these technical issues. And we know, O oh God, that we can record it and post it. And so we pray, O oh God, your blessing upon uh, this 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 um, devotion. And we pray, O oh God, that it would encourage us to know, O oh God, that you set up victory from the very get-go, as they say in the Bronx, from the get-go. Right from the beginning, you put into play the plan of redemption. As soon as mankind fell, there was put into effect a redemptive narrative. And it ends up with a new heaven and a new earth and a new creation. We pray for these that we've mentioned, each one of them, Iris, Herman, Ginny Delgado's parents, oh God. Helen, Sister Mimi's sister, have mercy upon her. Lord, and, and Jeanette, Peter Garcia's wife, have mercy on her. Put your healing hand on her. Lord, and our sister Sunny, oh Lord Santiago, Lord, Pastor Rafael's wife, Lord, bless her. Touch her lungs. Deliver her, oh God, I pray. Petiti Doris, Brother Mark, oh Lord, and, and Pastor Nancy, bless them with health and strength, O oh God. We thank you, Lord, for the promise of the Messiah. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. And in this Christmas, we, we expect, O oh God, to spend time honoring your gift and your sacrifice for us. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Praise God. All right, folks. Uh, so I'm going to say goodbye by... Uh, uh, putting this, I think, I don't know if it's going to go on, but God bless you and have a wonderful day. Hallelujah.